let's get into the word, shall we? I'm going to be speaking out of Acts 8. I'm going to begin in verse 4. And my text begins, it says, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was a great joy in that city, but there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But, but when? But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. God, we came here today with great expectation because we know that you are the only one who carries the divine blueprint for our life. Without you, we are nothing, we can do nothing, and we can say absolutely nothing that moves things on earth. But with you, my God, we can be anointed to preach the gospel. We can be anointed to set the captives free. We can be anointed to be in a light in a city that they say is too dark. With you, God, with you, we can do the impossible, and mountains must move because that's the kind of God we serve. So, God, we came here for impartation. We came here to receive more of your spirit. We came here to overflow until everything in our life looks like an anointing that comes only from heaven. Do that thing that you do when you sit in a room. Take control of this atmosphere. Oh, great God that you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated and get comfortable. As I was praying, I probably should have taken a moment to just thank God for the new update on Apple. Um, can I just tell you that when I got the update and they told me that one of the things that would be on the phone now is a way to track your screen time, I knew immediately I was in trouble. For those of you who don't operate in the spirit of Apple, we want to meet you after service to cast that spirit out of you. But for those of us who do, uh, we recognize that um, now with this update, they let you know how much time you spend in certain apps. And hypothetically speaking, if I were to have an addiction, it would be to Instagram. Um, hypothetically speaking if I had an addiction. And, and I don't think that I have an addiction because my husband has told me that I possibly spend too much time on social media. No, this is divine revelation. And um, I realized that part of the reason why I reason with myself for being on social media, it's really your fault, to be honest. You know, because I want to connect with you. I want to read your comments. I want to see how God is moving into your life. So technically, hypothetically, of course, you all would be the reason that I have a social media addiction. And so in this season with this new update, I realized immediately that I didn't want to see how much time I spent on Instagram. So I put a limit on it before it could even tell me. And so my limit is an hour of social media a day. An hour is really short. I mean, that first day, it was 9 o'clock in the morning, and I, your girl was just all out of time. I didn't have nothing left. Um, I, I think that I 
enjoy social media perhaps in a way that is not very healthy sometimes because I consider it my opportunity to be like a touch point for people. And I wonder if in the process of me being a touch point for people that I forget that I'm first a touch point for God to the people, not a touch point for the people. And if you don't realize that you are a touch point for God to people, then you will become a touch point exclusively to people. And let me tell you the danger in that is that people will have you making decisions about your life and about what's next for you. It's almost like they trick you into believing that you're trying to avoid a loss. And when you live life like you're trying to avoid a loss, you settle for just trying to keep your head above water. Because I don't want anyone else to see me fail. When you become a touch point for people, they dictate what success looks like. They dictate whether you are supposed to be married or not. They dictate whether or not you should have made it by now or not because you have become to live your life for people's access and for people's viewing. And I realized that that's one way to live life where we live life trying to avoid a loss. But another more divine, more strategic way to live is if we live like we're playing to win. If we win like heaven's resources are backing us up, so, so we already recognize that God has gone ahead of us. It, it sounds very similar because if you're trying to avoid a loss, perhaps you organically get a win, but that's not necessarily true because there's levels to this. But when you maneuver like you're playing to win, you just carry yourself differently. You're not seeking validation. It's when you are the ultimate touch point for God. God touched me, and so now I have been touched to be a touch and so now I maneuver differently because I know I have something to offer. I'm not looking for something to take. I'm a touch point for God. Touch your neighbor and say, I just felt God. You're a touch point for God. Whenever I touch you, I ought to feel a little divinity. Whenever I have a conversation, I want to feel a little divinity. I'm a touch point for God. And this is a big deal for me because I used to be a touch point for people. I used to live my life based on their opinions, asking them to accept me, asking them to love me, but then I messed around and met a savior who convinced me that I was fearfully and wonderfully made, that, that he had already created me and his grace was sufficient for everything that I had gone through. So now I live my life playing to win. I'm playing to win. I'm after something. I'm after something. I am after becoming a touch point for God. In every area, and in every arena of my life. I want to be a touch point in my marriage. I want to be a touch point on the job. And that doesn't mean that I grab my Bible and start preaching. It means that I don't allow the culture of that environment to get inside of me because I'm a touch point for God. There are some decisions that I have to make about my emotions, about my mind, about what music I listen to, about what I receive, because I can't allow anything to dilute my power. Because when God says, touch somebody, I want to be able to like cast the devil out. I want to be able to like perform a miracle. If he tells me to do it, I just want to have enough power built up on the inside of me. And so in my text, we have to realize that Philip has become a touch point for God. And I chose this part of the text because I realized that Philip was playing to win. And he's going to allow us on this evening to study from his life. For those of you who like to take notes, my subject is play to win. Play to win. When we find Philip in the text, just to set it up, I want to give you all some background. So Jesus has been crucified. He's been placed in the tomb. He is resurrected. He has come back onto earth. He's walked around for 40 days, and now he has ascended back to heaven. But when he ascended back to heaven, he didn't take everything with him. He left the Holy Spirit behind. And he gave the apostles and the disciples a charge, and that was to go into all of the world. The only thing is that when we find Philip into the text, one of his comrades in the gospel, Stephen, has just been stoned. 
And because Stephen has just been stoned, there is now a persecution on all Christians. And it's something that you have to realize that whenever you are committed to becoming a touch point for God, there will always be a persecution over you being a touch point. And the persecution begins long before you even realize that you are a touch point. God, give me grace. Eventually, Philip is going to touch the people of Samaria, and they will become touch points for God, too. But while Philip was on the way, he was trying to avoid persecution, not because Philip himself was worthy of being persecuted, but because of what Philip was willing to do for God and the lives connected to his name. The persecution had to begin before he got to his destination. Don't be, sur don't be surprised when you begin to experience persecution before you even get to your destination. It's a sign. Persecution. Persecution is a sign when you are a touch point for God. Persecution is a sign that you're shaking some things up on the earth. I'm not surprised when I've experienced persecution. Persecution is meant to kill what's inside of you. It's trying to keep that touch point from coming to the fullest manifestation. Yes, so persecution begins before you even know who you are fully. Can we go deeper? Persecution begins when you're a little kid wondering where you fit. Persecution begins when you watch your parents beating one another. Persecution begins when you have an addiction. Persecution begins when you have a teen pregnancy. Persecution begins when you go through a divorce. That persecution that was supposed to convince you that there was nothing in you was really trying to keep you from recognizing that God had placed so much in you, so much in you that it would affect everything connected to you. And so the enemy begins a plan thinking that if I can persecute them early, then they'll never develop Fully, but little did they know that the persecuted find a way no matter what. The persecuted find a way because before he formed me in my mother's womb, he already knew me. So before this life could persecute me, God had already touched me. And now I'm just trying to get back to the touch that created me. I wish I had some people in this room who had gone through some persecutions that was supposed to take them out of the game. But no matter what happened to them, they found themselves back on their knees crying out for God. God, I know I'm not worthy. God, I know I don't deserve it, but I can't get this touch off of me. Man tried to touch me, but your touch came rising to the top every time hell tried to touch me. It had to back away because before life touched me, God touched me. Before pain touched me, God touched me. Before hurt touched me, God touched me. And I'm just trying to get back to that touch. That touch is where my power is. That touch is where my creativity is. That touch is where my strategy is. That touch is where my healing is. Can I be a church girl in this place for a minute? I'm trying to get back to the touch. I'm trying to get back to the one who created me. I'm trying to get back to the original touch. Before heartbreak, before hurt, before pain, there was an original touch. He formed me, I know he did, because there's no way I should even be in this room. And I can't, I can't shake that touch. And every time I get in the presence of God, I'm just trying to be reminded of that touch, that you still see me, that you still know me, that you hear my prayers, that I'm not in this thing on my own. God, touch me just one more time. That's what desperation is. That's what worship is. God, if you just touch me one more time, then I know that I'm at the right place at the right time. I can't afford to lose that touch. If I get connected to somebody and I can't feel that touch anymore, I got to disconnect because I'm living for a touch. I'm living for something bigger than me. I'm living to change this world. World. And I can't change this world without the one who formed this world. So I got to stay connected to the touch. I got touch. Philip had been touched. And now that touch was under persecution. 
I was studying and there was something about this persecution that I thought was necessary for us to understand. I wrote down in my notes that persecution doesn't kill God's objective for your life. It only changes the position that he's going to do it from. So when Philip gets persecuted, he has to leave Jerusalem. If he were trying to keep from losing, he would have stopped trying to preach the gospel. But because he was committed to playing to win, even though he wasn't in the position where he first received the touch, he didn't allow his position to kill his objective. I'm on a mission and I'm playing to win. And persecution, it moves you, it shifts you, it changes your occupation, it changes your location. Persecution shakes up your life, but I want to know, did persecution change your objective? I feel God on that. Yeah. Did persecution change your objective? The moment you began to realize that it was going to be harder than you imagined to realize the purpose that God placed on you, did you change your mind about what he wants you to do? Yeah, Philip was playing to win, but not all of us are playing to win. That's why we're here. Some of us are trying to keep from losing. And when you're trying to keep from losing, your objective can be changed very easily because you're trying to avoid a loss. But when you're playing to win and what God placed on you must come forth by any means necessary, you'll waitress during the day and write at night because I still have an objective even though my position has changed. I'll cry in the nighttime, but then I'll get up in the morning and put my game face on because I'm on an objective. And just because I'm being persecuted doesn't mean that my mission has changed. I need you to know that persecution doesn't change your mission. It only changes your position. And it makes you say, okay, God, now this is where you have me, so tell me what I'm supposed to do from here. Because I'm going to do it. Because you told me that no one else could do it but me. So God, show me how to be effective in this position because the persecution can't convince me that you didn't call me because you touched me <laughs> and because you touched me I know that the persecution is trying to keep me from multiplying that touch that radically changed my life. So Philip says, I was persecuted into position. I didn't get into position because everything went the way that I thought it would. I didn't get into position because I had the right parents and the right background. I didn't get into position because someone handed me a fat check. I didn't get into position because life for me hasn't been no crystal stair. What y'all know about that? I didn't get into position because everything was easy for me. I was persecuted into position. I had to cry myself into position. I had to run away from some things to get into position. And then I looked around and recognized that I was exactly where I was supposed to be because the God gospel must be spread throughout all the world. So he put me in the middle of a situation I never wanted to be in because he knew that touch would rise to the top. Persecuted into position. Man, that's a word all on to itself. Did you hear? You got it. I feel it. You got it. I was persecuted into position. I went through a teenage pregnancy. I went through a divorce all so that I could be your pastor. If life had gone for me the way I wanted it to, I would never be here. But I was persecuted into position. I was persecuted into purpose. I was persecuted until I said, by any means necessary, what God placed down on the inside of me must come forth. You threw a stone, but it cracked open my oil. The persecution, oh, I feel God on that. The persecution cracked open my oil. It cracked open my power. Thank you for the persecution.
persecution. Thank you for walking away from me. Thank you because it didn't go the way I wanted it to. I got persecuted. Yeah, yeah, I got persecuted here. It's too early for that, you can't get them started because if they start looking back over their life, I'm gonna lose the whole memory. I'm gonna lose the whole service. Please, it's too early for that. I got some people in this room who got persecuted into purpose. I got some people in this room who went through hell and they came out not smelling like smoke. God, I thank you for the stones that were thrown in my direction. God, I thank you for the insecurities that made me relatable to your people. God, I thank you that when they walked away, I only had one choice and that was to create. God, I thank you. I didn't just get here. I was persecuted into position. And the beautiful thing about being persecuted into position is that you don't shake easy. And you don't get scared easy. Because I already survived persecution. <laughs> and if I can survive persecution, I can survive some gossip and a rumor. I can survive losing a job. I can survive you walking away from me. I got persecuted to be here so that the glory could be manifested in my life. I got persecuted. And now every time I feel persecution, I expect another dimension of glory because that's what persecution has done for me. So give me your best shot. I know I've been feeling a little down lately, but I feel my help coming. I feel like I'm gonna start playing to win. And so hell, I want you to know that you picked a fight with the wrong one. You picked a fight with somebody who's seen God's glory show up in their life. And when he gets finished with me, everything connected to me is gonna be a reflection of his glory. I'm gonna be a monument of his grace. I'm gonna be a monument. I'm gonna be a touch point. And that's why I can still smile in the face of those who I know are talking to me, about me. And that's why I can keep a smile on my face. And that's why I can forgive and that's why I can let go because I'm a touch point. Y'all sit down, no, y'all done got happy. I'm not even in my notes. <sighs> Guys, calm down. If you've never been here on a Thursday night, they act all kinds of crazy. You and I are very civilized, but them, I don't know about them. So Philip, <laughs> Philip first experiences persecution. And when my text begins, he's been scattered. And though he's been scattered, his mission has to continue because he's playing to win. And he's not allowing the persecution to make him be silent. But persecution is one level. There's another dimension, and that is opposition. Persecution tries to kill what's in you. Opposition tries to discredit your ability. But the opposition is created to force you to take your game to the next level, because we're playing to win, right? So when I experience opposition, you gotta know the difference between persecution and opposition. Persecution is meant to kill what's inside of you before it can be fully manifest. Opposition is when you begin to manifest it, but they try to discredit what you're manifesting. And the opposition is created to force you to take your ability to the next level. <sighs> Okay, 
So Philip's opposition is the sorcerer. For years, the sorcerer has been in Samaria and he's been doing all types of tricks and he's been doing all types of miracles and it looks like he and Philip are the same, but they're not the same. And one train of thought would be like Philip was just supposed to go in there and start preaching the gospel and instantly people would be saved. But he needs opposition and you need opposition because opposition forces you to take your game to the next level. I know you don't want any competition. I know you want things to be easy. I know you don't want to have to deal with the IRS and I know you don't want to have to climb your way up the ladder. But you need opposition because opposition teaches you how to navigate and maneuver. You need a little opposition in your life because opposition is how you train. Opposition is how you dig deeper and pull out something that you never thought was down on the inside of you. And I would have never done it unless I had opposition. <sighs> I got to say it the way I studied it because I think it's important for you to recognize that opposition is your training ground. Some of your oppositions are just toxic relationships, trying to discredit your anointing. And so you have to overcome your opposition so that the real version of you can become manifest. <laughs> you need opposition. God, I want to move on, but I don't feel like y'all have fully received that the way God gave it to me. I'll tell you, lately, I was experiencing some opposition in my life. And I was trying to determine if the opposition was a sign that I shouldn't be doing it or a sign that I could be doing it better. But every time I tried to give it up, I kept feeling the touch to pick it back up. But the opposition was still there. And I realized that the opposition wasn't about me getting to set it down, getting me to set it down. The opposition was about getting me to change the way I was navigating and functioning in, my, in the realm of my purpose. Opposition will have you talking to accountants. Opposition will have you creating a business plan and a budget. Opposition will have you preparing on this level for the next level dream that God has already given you. So I gave you opposition on this level so that when you get to this level, you don't have to restructure. I gave you the opposition so that you can start organizing and strategizing and seeing who your friends were and who they really are and seeing where your anointing works and where it doesn't work. I gave you some opposition. Stop praying your opposition away and start asking God, what is this opposition trying to teach me? Because I'm playing to win, I don't just back off easy. I need to know what the opposition is trying to teach me about me and the way that I do what I do. So Philip has this opposition. And Philip combats the opposition. And that's really what I, what I want to talk about because we're playing to win. And, and Philip recognizes that he has to win the people of Samaria. And the first thing he does is he preaches Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. I looked up that word heeded, and it comes from a Greek word that basically means attention. That the people of Samaria, he had the attention of the people of Samaria. So he used what they were familiar with to get their attention. That was the first level of combating the opposition. See, some of you all won't preach like me. Some of you will, you know, but some of you won't grab a microphone. What you're going to do instead is you're going to use what the world has for attention to dilute the power of that which doesn't lead them back to God. I'm creating music, and it sounds good, but my music has an ulterior motive because my music is trying to become a touch point for God. 
I am creating a script, but my script has an ulterior move motive. It looks like everything you've seen before, but it's nothing you've ever seen before because there's an ulterior motive working underneath this thing that ultimately is trying to get you back to a point where you can be touched the same way that I have been touched. Are there any kingdom people in this room that are trying to be a touch point. I'm using what gets the world's attention, but only so that I can tell them about my God. So when I say I'm doing it for the kingdom and the culture, what I'm really saying is that I'm using the culture to get them back to the kingdom. The culture has been used against us plenty of times. Now I'm going to use the culture. Oh, so you like fashion. Let's talk about fashion. And after you get dressed, I want to tell you about my savior. Oh, so you like music okay that's dope let's talk about music but when we get finished talking about music I want to tell you about a man from Galilee who can give you the power to overcome depression I want to prophesy to some people in this room that you're going to be in some rooms that you should have never been in and when you get in there don't forget that you are a touch point for God that means don't just talk about an addiction break that thing off of them don't just talk about what's wrong break that thing off of them you are a touch point for God and when darkness is in your realm it ought to get nervous I'm a touch point I'm a touch point I can go anywhere and I'll still be a touch point and God will send me anywhere because he knows I'm a touch point because he knows that when I get there I'm really there to cast some things out I'm really there to push some darkness off of people come on activate LA what are you really trying to do in this thing you trying to get attention for your sake or you trying to do something that leads people back to God yeah that's all I want to be is a touch point. So Philip uses the same thing that Samaria is used to seeing, but he does it a little bit differently. And first they heeded the things that Philip was doing. But something happens in verse 12 where it goes from them just heeding what Philip was doing. Verse 12, if you can put it on the screen for me, verse 12 says that they went from heeding the miracles and the signs and wonders, and then it switched into belief. You got to know the difference between attention and then attention that is converted into belief. I'm saying don't just ask for attention. Give somebody something to believe in. Something to believe in so that when they're no longer with you, they still got power to access what they received when they were in your midst. I don't just want your attention so that I can have a bunch of followers and so that people can say my name is great. I'm actually on a mission. I'm going to use your attention and convert your attention into belief into the one who sent me. I didn't just get here on my own. This is bigger than me. This is greater than me. If you get me, you failed. If you get him, no weapon formed against you will prosper. If you get me, something went wrong. If you get me, something, something wasn't in alignment. But if I get you back to him, I've turned this attention into belief. Verse 12 says, but, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of of Jesus Christ. Philip began preaching about the kingdom of God. He started saying and telling what my father would call the greatest love story of all time. That you started in a realm you cannot see. And life tried to separate you from that realm. But a man named Jesus came and became a touch point so that you could have access to that dimension again. And so while they were marveling at what Philip was doing, Philip flipped the script on them because they had spent time marveling at what the sorcerer was doing as well. But this is what Philip did that really flipped the script. He said, everything you see me doing, you can do too. <laughs> see, that's good. You see, my girl caught it back there. 
because the world wants you to idolize them and what they can do. But when you're kingdom, you're meant to activate something down on somebody else. I know you see me shining, but let me tell you, I'm just a reflection of what's down on the inside of you. So when we leave this building, Activate LA, I don't want you just looking for followers for followers sake. I want you looking for who you can activate. That same thing you see in me, that same peace, that same joy, that same strength that you see in me, you have access to. I'm telling you, don't just marvel at me. Let that activate what's down on the inside of you. Philip flipped the script. You can do miracles too. Everything, I feel that. I'm going to prophesy this. (laughs) Everything that Samaria had seen up until that point was them marveling at what someone else can do and perhaps even envying what someone else could do. They didn't realize that it was just a preview of what they could do. And I wanna prophesy to some people in this room who have been marveling at the gifts and talents of other people and wondering why is it they seem so far from what they can do. And I prophesy that everything that you have been marveling is just a preview of what God can do down on the inside of you. That if you will receive this word and the power of the Holy Ghost to destroy every yoke attached to your gift, that you will go from marveling at miracles to being a miracle. God, I didn't just come here to Look at someone else shine. God, I came here because you placed the light that's down on the inside of my soul. And God, I'm burning to do something for you. I'm burning to convert this attention into belief. I'm burning. God is not tormenting you with what you've seen. And he is not taunting you and trying to make you believe that you cannot do it. It is a preview of what is down on the inside of you. (laughs) Philip, Philip never lost sight of his mission. Philip realized that if I perform miracles and, and I leave it at that, and I don't convert the people, then I didn't do what God called me to do. Philip knows that he's moving past Samaria. And every time he's moving past an arena, every time he's moving past a level, he's trying to create a conversion. You are where you are right now because you have the power to create a conversion in that realm. A conversion of depression into joy. A conversion from suicide into abundant life. There's power. You've been in this ministry. You're in this room right now. This is not by coincidence. This is divine strategy. You have the power. You have resurrecting power to go into your places of work, to go into your relationships, to go into your families. Come on, somebody. You can run up on addiction. Come on, somebody. I wish I had some people. See, they were hungry in Samaria because they had been without power for so long. Don't get so comfortable with power that you start looking at other people's power and not asking God to give me another dose of power because I want to cast some addiction off of people. I want to send some people into rehab so that they can live to the best version of who they are. I want to do something in this earth. I don't want to just go to church is what I'm saying. I don't want to just know worship songs is what I'm saying. I want to pass by environments and shake everything up because I came carrying something that can change your life. You have the hidden sauce you kingdom baby can I get goalie with y'all y'all know how I like to do you kingdom baby everywhere you go things ought to shift you kingdom kid everywhere you go darkness ought to back off come on activate LA where you at what you trying to do you trying to be like the culture you trying to do it for God 
I'm trying to do something in this industry. I'm trying to do something in this city. I'm trying to do something for my siblings. I'm trying to activate everything that God placed down on the inside of them. It can't just be me on stage. I'm not excited until everybody is in. Everybody's got to get some. Everybody needs some power. Anytime I see a homeless person, anytime I see addiction, anytime I see brokenness, anytime I see fame but no power, I see that I'm the answer. I see God why you placed me here. It wasn't about money and it wasn't about fame. It wasn't about my name and life. It was about me unleashing this power so that they could unleash their power, so that we could wage war on hell. Can I preach some kingdom talk? to some people in this room. It's gonna be a chain reaction. It's gonna be a chain reaction. They're gonna still be talking about God when I leave this place. They're gonna still be talking about joy when I leave this place. I'm changing the culture, baby. And I'm doing it armed with power. And I'm doing it armed with heaven's resources. Spirit of the living God, you're still alive. You're still performing miracles. The kingdom of God is still at hand. The kingdom of heaven is still here. And God, I'm looking for marching orders. God, I'm looking for you to send me. The kingdom of heaven is still here. How do I know? Because I still see darkness. And if I still see darkness, there's still work for me to do. If I still see pain, there's still work for me to do. If I still see depression, there's still work for me to do. If addiction won't let somebody go, it's still work for me to do. If there's still abuse is still work for me to do. God, let me know what I'm supposed to do in this season. I want to bring your kingdom into Hollywood. I want to bring your kingdom into my marriage. I want to bring your kingdom to the White House. I want to bring your kingdom everywhere I go because your kingdom came to me and it changed my life. So I don't play for me no more. I play for him. And I hear you coaching me that my next game is coming up. And I hear you training me that this time I'm going to win. And I hear you coaching me to leave some people alone and to connect with some people who understand what the kingdom is. And to connect with some people who know who I am in the kingdom. Bring forth more of your kingdom out of my life, out of my creativity, out of my finances, until hell gets nervous. Seek ye first the kingdom. Come on, activate. We got to turn this city upside down. I don't want to see another homeless person. I don't want to see another addiction. I don't want to see another suicide. Not if I'm still here. God, give me a word and I'll speak it. Give me an idea and I'll create it. Impart your spirit into everything I do. I don't just want to perform miracles. I want to multiply miracles. I want to lead people back to you. I want to show them that you can be pure and still in this industry. I want to show them that you can be pure coming from the background that I came from. I want to show them that forgiveness is real. I want to show them that restoration is possible. I want to show them that you are a redeemer. My God, if there are any redeemed people in this room, can you just say so? Can you just say so? Let the redeemed of the Lord. I should have been strung out, but I got redeemed. I should have been broken, but I got redeemed. I should have been crazy, but I got redeemed. And I have 
been redeemed for a reason. And it's not just so I can feel good, but so that I can save a dying world. And God, if you just attach one soul to my life, I'll be okay with that. Because it takes humility to be effective. I'm a world changer. And I start one soul at a time. So everything I do from this point, I'm going to do differently. Because I'm playing to win souls. I'm playing to win against darkness. Even the darkness that lives within me. Yeah. Darkness, you can't have no more room in me. Darkness, you got to let me go. Insecurities, fear, depression, anxiety. You can't have no more room in me. I'm playing to win. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It wasn't just Philip's power, it's my power too. The kingdom of heaven is coming to my depression. The kingdom of heaven is coming to my anxiety. The kingdom of heaven is coming to my fear. The kingdom of heaven is coming to this addiction. I want to pray for some people. I want to pray for everybody. Y'all done made me preach out my clothes. They're going to be disliking my video on YouTube. Can y'all stand up so that we can pray? Heaven has come down as far as it's going to go. It's on you now to start reaching up. It's on you to start getting hungry. When his anointing meets your hunger, that's when miracles break out. When his anointing meets your hunger, when it meets your desperation, don't be so comfortable that you forgot that you need another dose because it feels good in this room. But I need power for when I'm at the office. I need power for when I'm dealing with that person who hurt me. I need the kingdom of heaven to not just be in this room, but to follow me everywhere I go. I'm looking for a new job. I need the kingdom of heaven. I'm trying to save my mama. I need the kingdom of heaven. I'm hungry for it. I'm desperate for it. God, if you don't do it, it can't be done. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Nisi. Oh, I feel the presence of God in this place. I feel like LA is gonna be set on fire. I feel like they're gonna to come to meet a newer generation that is on fire, that understands the culture, but does it for the kingdom. I feel like this world is gonna be set on fire. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh in this place. God, I ask that you would take us from marveling at the acts of other people to standing in awe at what you can do through us. God, I'm asking you to clear the way of every believer in this room, that they would be activated into the next dimension of their destiny, that they would experience a breakthrough like never before, that hell would get nervous when they wake up in the morning. God, I prophesy right now in the name of Jesus that you are giving them a fresh fire anointing, that you are placing dreams and creativity down on the inside of them that is going to shake up the industries that they are in God may we keep in the forefront of our mind that we are first a touch point for God I'm a touch point for you not for man not for this world but for you so God create opportunities where you send these, your sons and daughters, into rooms they should never be in. Not because they need something, but because they have something to give. And when you give them the sign to release it, I feel the presence of God. When you cue for the floodgates of heaven to be open, let it come through them like a mighty rushing wind. God, let addiction be broken because they opened their mouth. Let depression be broken because they stepped into the room. May they change the lives of the people who you have assigned to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen.